I, I, um, I came to Berkeley in 1973, and I, and I knew no one. Uh, and um, I hadn't really been in California. And so I came straight from Oxford, uh, dared to defend my thesis in Princeton, and then straight to Berkeley. So when I landed here um, with a duffel bag, I was 27. Um, and I knew nothing, and I was taken in um, by uh, a colleague in Russian history uh, named Reggie Zelnick. And it's through Reggie Zelnick that I met my first emigre professor, though probably not from fascism, but from, but from the Russian Revolution, a man named Nicholas Ryazanovsky, who was um, um, a white Russian who'd ended up in Harban. Um, and it was a man of the world. It was said that he spoke no language without an accent, um, in that he spoke Russian in Harban with a French um, nanny and learned English in America. So, so I, I really came to Berkeley a kind of tabula rasa. Um, but I found pretty quickly a community of people that I identified as the, as sort of the local emigrate community, the generation of my parents who were here, and I identified them. I felt identified with them as sort of intellectuals of, 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 of this generation in which I think my parents would have liked to have belonged if things had worked out slightly differently. Can you describe what, for you, what that meant? What, what, was, what were those uh, common grounds? How you identified? What, what, what characterized this immigrant community in your, in your view? Well, in some of this immigrant community, they were, they were um, uh, the immigrant community here was was I knew were, were really the generation of my parents. So they had a story that was different than my parents' stories, and was they came here rather than going to Istanbul as my parents went. Um, but I could very much, they had stories that were like the stories that I knew. So in this sense, I connected with them. I felt an affinity with them right away. And I felt an affinity with some of them um, in terms of their Jewishness. I mean, so this was a little bit later, but I mean, Leo Lowenthal and always joke with each other that we hadn't had a bar, bar mitzvah and the next year we would have a bar mitzvah. And I always assumed that it meant that he knew nothing about, um, very much about Judaism. But I learned subsequently from my colleague Marty Jay that he actually had a whole period where he was deeply interested in his Jewish roots and in uh, Jewish learning and the relationship with Jews to Germany. So it was, it was some, some of these were slightly false identifications I learned later on. But so in a sense, I identify with them. I'm not, so not exa maybe as a son, as a younger col as a younger colleague, but as someone who had experiences that I could, that I could, a life that I could connect with. And the slightly older ones, I mean, Hans Rosenberg, who I think was a little bit older, maybe five, ten years older than these other guys, or at least felt older to me, uh, mainly because he dressed in these sort of Central European blue s suits that looked like out of a the Third Man, or some movie about Vienna or Berlin after the, in, the, in the in the 50s. So he felt to me at least older than my father, and he took me under his wing very early in Berkeley, like the second or third week. Um, and I felt a little bit that this was like a great the great German historical school somehow, or its spirit alighting on my shoulders. So he had been a student of Meineke. And it's not that many generations from that back to Diltai. And, you know, you can trace this back to the age of the giants. So the immigrant community, is, as I encountered here, is someplace very diverse. So they wore different things. I mean, I always thought that it was very odd. And you saw um, Leo Loventhal, who was a very dapper dresser. Uh, and he would walk around with Hans Rosenberg, who was the opposite of a dapper dresser. So it was this guy in this blue square cut suit from the old country and a guy who wore very elegant cashmere sweaters uh, and and very well tailored jackets so so in some sense there isn't a, a, it was a type of scholar um are they, almost all of them i knew were german or austrian or german speaking i don't remember speaking german to them they spoke english and they in the public world and we spoke as far as i remember um spoke english um and um they were extremely welcoming to me. I don't know if they were welcoming because they recognized as a child of an emigre, or they were welcoming to everyone. Um, but 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 Hans Rosenberg took me to lunch my second or third week at Berkeley. He was retired, so he must have been in his late sixties when I was twenty-seven. So he was at least 
40 years older than I was, and he, I think he'd been retired for a while. So this was a, a person older, considerably older than my father was um, at that time. And he took me to lunch, and, and um, I can't remember whether I actually called, I think I called it Professor Rosenberg. I think I couldn't have called him Hans. Um, but he took me to a, to, a, um, to a local hamburger place called Kipps, and clearly everyone knew him. And later a student told me, he says, I didn't know that you knew Mr. Jumboburger. Apparently he goes to the Kips every day. And I want to say Jumbo Berger to you, you know. But he was he was a, he, he ate these large sandwich these these big jumbo burgers this place each time. And um and he asked me about my work and that and then I in a story I tell my students because it was it's it seems slightly miraculous. He took me to the mailroom, and I was just going up complaining about fixing up my dissertation, which was on Sunday schools and working class culture, and, and some minor point about controversies in writing in these Sunday schools, which seemed pretty trivial in the great world historical scene. And, and he, I, mean, I can't say if he really put his hands on my shoulder, but I imagine him putting his hands on my shoulder. But he did really say that he says, young man, you must always remember that the task of the historian is to connect the particular with the cosmic. And I felt, well, I was certainly good on particulars. I knew all about controversies in Methodist Sunday schools and every bit of the sociology of who taught Sunday schools where. But the cosmic <coughs> eluded me. But he was very kind to me from right early on. And, and the same thing with two, two other older scholars, I mean, uh, older than said people 40, uh, 40 years older than I am, or close to 40 years older. One was Reinhard Bendix, who started a seminar um, my first year in Berkeley with people from, mostly with sociology, an anthropologist. And we discussed each other's work, and we discussed his work, and we discussed an early version of his um, autobiography, um, and we met at his house. Um, so I felt very much welcomed by him, and he had this, I, I know much more about him now than I, than I knew then, having now read the published autobiography and knowing um, through students here who were working on him um, in the 30s, he was a member of a very radical um, anti-fascist resistance group uh, in Germany. But what he offered here, or offered to us, was this um, sense of the importance of this high German sociological tr tradition. He, he had translated Weber. Uh, he knew all there was to know about Weber. And he brought this sort of seriousness of this old school um, historical sociology uh, to all of us. And so whether we're working on different topics, um, it struck me as a level of seriousness, a sort of intellectual gravitas, which, which was wonderful for, for a 27-year-old. Um, and then, there, and then Leo Lovendahl had a seminar. I didn't go as often to that. And Marty J was more involved with this, and Ricky Bunnell and these other, various other people. Uh, but 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 Leo was all, but Leo. I would see in a more sort of friendly fashion. Um, I mean, he probably was he was august and very learned. But I, he did, he didn't have that. He didn't carry himself with the weightiness of say Rosenberg or. Um, or, or, or Bendix. And then I knew on the side other people. I knew Günter Stent because I worked in the medical program. So one, and I knew then my younger colleagues who had emigrated that I, that I connected with right away as having an almost common story. So Jerry Kaspari was a, a very brilliant medievalist who, who um, befriended me very early in my time here. And he um, was 15 years older than I am. And he ended up in France and in hiding um, and coming to this country uh, not very much, early, I mean, two years before I did, but he came as, a, as an 18-year-old rather than as a five-year-old. So we had a sort of common world, and it was also a common world of German Jewishness and a complex relationship to, to being German and being Jewish. So in that sense, both the people near to my age and people of my father's generation gave me a sense of a, of, a, of a continuity with the world that was um, the world of my parents. Um, and I, I, think, I think the reason I reacted as strongly to this as I did is that my parents' world was very much an emigre world. That is to say, they, we spoke German at home. 
Uh, we ate German food. Um, it was almost a denial. And we lived in West Virginia, so there was no other German community. So we only kept this German up as a kind of um, like a pod on another planet. Um, so in some sense, meeting these guys was a sense of meeting this world that my parents had left, only they're actually in a real world and not in a cold town, not in cold town in West Virginia. So I, I, had, I, had, a big, I had a big identification with them. Uh, um, I mean, a cathexis that was sort of very powerful beyond what they did for me in terms of the individual seminars and things to read and discussions and so forth. So, <coughs> would you characterize, I mean, maybe, as you are characterizing also yourself, but this, this group of people as living in, living in more, inhabiting more than one world at once? And if so, could you describe the worlds in which they... Well, live? look, I, I, the, the question is really, did they, did, what world did these, these people in, inhabit? And look, I was very young, so I didn't really have a sense of where their interior lives were. Um, I felt they were people of Berkeley. And, and, and Bendix, for example, had been chair of his department. And Lovendal had been chair of his department. Um, Good Stent in biology had been chair of this. These are people who were actively involved in the, in the running of the university and in the law school, these people were major professors and it, so these they were they were certainly people of Berkeley and there's no question about their engagement and caring for Berkeley but I, I, I think they lived my sense is they lived in this a world that that they spoke to each other I think they spoke German though I couldn't swear to that but people would you had a sense they were part of this a, 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 another world as well so I mean Herbert Marcuse would come up and visit his pal Leo Lowenthal so you felt well there's another part of this Frankfurt School World getting together from Southern California, and Rosenberg would power around with Loventhal. So you had a feeling that they had a world. In fact, I'm sh I know they had an, a world that was a, that was slightly separate, and they were slightly younger members of this too. Paul Alexander, my department, who was a brilliant philologist and late stuff, student of late late antiquity, was sort of slightly younger member of this group. So uh, my sense is they had their own world as well, but I I didn't. I mean, I was invited to their dinner parties with their older friends. I was invited to parties with younger friends. But these people all made younger friends. I mean, I think there was a real commitment to, to young people. And, and, um, and I kept up with them till they, till they died or left. I mean, so it wasn't just as a 27-year-old. I kept up with Leo till I died 15 years ago. I mean, so I was in the 50. So it, they, they, did, they were interested in making friendships. So in that sense, they were of Berkeley, and they clearly cared about Berkeley. I think in terms of Berkeley politics, I think they had very different views. I mean, I've never really studied what their views were. I think, um, I don't think they were wild. In fact, I'm sure they weren't sympathetic to 68. Um, I think they were sympathetic to the free speech movement. Um, but by the time, but, but they, I wouldn't say these were people who looked backward a great deal. I mean, I didn't, I didn't have a big sense of, of nostalgia, as I did with my own parents. In my parents' generation, I think because all the people who came here actually did well. That is to say, they came at a time when they came to great university, their careers were interrupted, but they had a, they had lives, and many emigres weren't quite um, as successful. So people who who studied law in Europe didn't do so well in this country, for example, right? So these people, I think, were sort of happy in themselves here, but they certainly didn't, in my sense, didn't didn't get, they they didn't give up their other other worlds. I mean, I, so I think they didn't. They inhabited two worlds. My suspicion is they inhabited the German, the Central European world with each other more than with us. And my relationship to, to their relationship to the Central European world might have been phantasmic, in the sense that I didn't quiz them. Um, but 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 it, I, I think it's actually true. It could be documented that they did bring kinds of Germans mostly German, I mean, Central European scholarship to my generation in Berkeley. Um, and they did it quite differently than, say, other people who did political theory or who did history and so forth. So in this otherworldliness or like multiple worlds that these, uh, these people inhabited, do you see a kernel of global mind and mindfulness that uh, seems to characterize Berkeley, you were sort of going in this direction. Well, in other words, uh, did this uh, did their experience as refugee 
also have an impact on both their scholarship and the kind of scholarship that younger generations inherited from them, learned and inherited? Well, it's a, it's a, the question is really, the issue is really how, what intellectual worlds they inhabit. And my sense is they taught, these people taught American students, so they clearly couldn't expect a level of the linguistic or philosophical sophistication from a 20-year-old American student that they would have found, I suspect, in the students of their generation. Um, and certainly the students that they were teaching when I came here would have been people who hadn't had anything like the experiences they'd had growing up in the 20s. So um, my, my, my sense is that they brought with them um, a sort of worldliness that was not just an intellectual worldliness in the sense that they were heirs to this great tradition, but that they were also, they brought with them a kind of experiential worldliness. You know, again, it's, a, it's, a, it's hard to, 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 to specify that in the sense that what kind of, because a lot of this is my, Fantasmic relationship to them, in the sense that I imagine people who had lived through being a Jewish student in the late 20s and the early 30s and dealing with this European crisis would have felt differently. And when I think of letters of my parents writing back and forth to each, writing to their families when they were in their 20s, they deal with issues that were a lot more serious than my problem of not being able to figure out what chapters I was going to divide my thesis into. So, so, I, so I, which are the sort of things that bothered me? So my feeling of them always was that they brought with them um, this, 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 this global perspective and this perspective of political crisis. And I do think it informed their work. Um, I, I mean, it'd be hard for me to specify exactly how it informed their work because some of the things they were interested in, they thought of before the, I mean, I mean, Bendix was onto his things, and Lewenthal was onto this as a student before the rise of Hitler. But that, of course, you can go back to the politics of, the, of Weimar and how that informed them. I mean, so that I'm, not, I'm not so much speaking as a historian. I can't tell you how um, the actual intellectual history of the, of the 20s affected their intellectual formation as someone else. But my feeling about them, and I think other people's feeling about them, was that you were participating in a global world, and I think we're going to Leo's seminar, or going to, to, to Reinhardt's seminar, um, felt that they were, they were sharing, um, in, in, in meeting the people they brought up, sharing in another world, and meeting Rosenberg. You know, we were sharing another world. I mean, he was a member of a kind of historical seminar in school that didn't exist anymore, and it didn't really have a lineage back to the, to the 19th century. Um, so it's global, and it's also very much in, in deep time. At least that's that's how I felt it, but again, that and almost I'm giving you a kind of psychoanalytic approach rather than a kind of historian's approach. I mean, I'm not a student of the diaspora in a kind of way that I could do the intellectual history of these people. Well, I, there is there is a there is a sense in which when in, when thinks of what the impact of the people were, it um, seems I felt more, you could you could you, it would be hard to be. Very precise, but for example, I do know that people in the philosophy department uh, still felt the influence of Tarski, though Tarski had retired. And so the logicians there were still working on Tarski. And I don't know whether Fire Abin counts as an emigre in this sort of sense or not, but Fire Abin was still present in my day um, and was very important in the I mean, fight and fall with his colleagues. So even, so, you're, so even when I wasn't directly involved, I know people, I do, I, people did speak about Tarski. Um, so you, you, you had a feeling that these guys, the spirit was, was around and they talked about Segre. And so you knew these people were part of this Berkeley world, even though it didn't affect me personally, um, directly. So, um, I mean, I think it'd be worth at some point exploring oral histories of other people who came at this time and understand how they felt, um, and trying to put together, in some sense, the nature of these different cohorts. I think this exhibition can only begin to think about that. Because I think, for example, at the law school, there were all these people who began university in Germany and they came here and studied American law. You know they had it, we, we, we know from their students, and I've spoken to people, it was had a very different approach to law than someone who'd done all their training here. But specifying that would be difficult. But everyone knew there was this, this world of these people. Um, and they, Dauber was another person. Um, Stefan Kuttner, 
these people who were, you realize how learned they were when we tried to replace them. Because I know when Stefan, we were, I was a little bit involved in trying to find a replacement for Stefan Kuttner, and it just wasn't happening. In the sense that they just, you know, these very smart people these days, but this, the, kind, the, the sort of um, tradition of learning that someone like Kuttner brought to canon law was hard to reproduce in another, in another generation. Not that the new generation has other things to say for them. But so, so I, I think I, my, my feeling about being in Berkeley when I was in my late 20s and 30s and early 40s was that there, these people were, they, they were really present. They were present to each other. Um, and they were present to a lot of us at different generational levels. And then I could add to that, it doesn't stop at some point. So I didn't sort of connect to my friend Jerry Kaspari's Holocaust past till I was in my um, late 50s. And I suppose he was in his early 70s. I mean, he was a man who suddenly discovered um, that um, um, uh, his, the depth of his connection to the Holocaust. I mean, I wouldn't say he suddenly discovered. He knew that his parents had been killed at Auschwitz. That wasn't news. But he, but he um, had never taught about it and wasn't interested in it. So in some sense, I was involved in another set of stories with him about his discovery of that part of his history. And he then wrote a memoir. He, through circuitous um, sort of happenstance, got a great cache of letters that his mother had written from hiding in France to her mother who was safe in Sweden. And so he then produced an autobiography, helped him translate some of these letters. No one, he didn't really want to edit them. But, but so, so I became engaged in another sort of emigre story and another Holocaust story that was not the story of the generation of the fathers, so to speak, but the generation of the older brothers. Um, and so the death of someone like Gaspari does make me feel a little bit bereft. I sort of feel I'm the last of this. Um, of this crowd, or my generation here is the last of these people who have a direct connection with these um, with this world. You you were born in Turkey uh, in a refugee family. Um, although your intellectual biography is very much part of the United States, it's where you intellectually you you grew up, and and then Berkeley, of course. Do you feel that this uh, uh, biographical element is more than just biography in terms of uh, in terms of your intellectual growth. Well, in terms of my intel the re my relationship to these two in terms of my intellectual growth is is sort of complicated because again I think it's a slightly f phantasmic relationship I had to or have to Germany in the sense that um, I, I had I had. My first time in Germany was actually in the 1990s. So, we, and the shocking thing about being in Germany, I actually gave my first lecture ever in German, and it was slightly surprising to me that people outside of my immediate family understood German. I mean, not in, in it, I would have checked the box, yes, they did, but I, but, but, but my relationship to, to, to German was very, was, a, was a, almost private language. So in some sense, these people seem slightly familial, or slightly part of this of a world that I identify with my with my parents. Um, so it's while it's the case that all my intellectual form, my entire intellectual formation is is uh, American. Um, is here, um, you know, my parents had me read German books when I was a kid, um, and read them to me. So they, there was a sense in which. I, um, I, I don't think they actually were very successful in making the migration, or I don't think they were as successful as my colleagues here were. Though again, I don't have access to to their inner lives in a way I know much more about my parents' lives. Um, so I, I would say my relationship with these people is mediated by that part of my biography, which is this um, strange identification with things German. Um, and also with things Jewish, and I discovered later that this relation, question about German and Jewish is something that bothered my father. And I, about 10 years ago, I got this long account, maybe 40 pages, that my grandfather had written in 1907 
um, about his relationship to being Jewish and whether one could be a scientist and be Jewish. And then a set of letters from his mother to the chief rabbi of Sweden, whom she was friends with, where she sent copies of this to the chief rabbi and asked whether her son had really fallen off the deep end. So in some sense, I keep discovering that these things that slightly bother me have these roots. So it's almost this sort of strange sort of, um, I, well, though I don't believe in this, but it's a g genetic propensity to worry about, about some set of issues. Because I know we never discussed these with my father, and I certainly didn't, I didn't know my grandfather. Um, and we grew up in isolation in West Virginia, so this wasn't in the air. So, um, so, so in any case, I, I brought to the emigrate community that I knew a great deal of identification. So Günther Stamm was from Breslau, and I knew where he was from in Breslau, I knew where my family was from in Breslau. So there's a sense in which I am, um, th there's more autobiography than history in what I'm telling you. And so I wouldn't take very much of what I say as, um, as historically true, though I think some of it's historically true. I can name you who was, who was in the seminar, who my colleagues were, we read. So that, that is actually factual insofar as one remembers things. But much of the rest of my account of this is, is fantastic.